Welcome to the Practical Growth Podcast. I'm your host, E.B. Johnson, top writer on Medium.com, published author, and master practitioner of neuro-linguistic programming. You've landed on the podcast that takes you on a journey into the heart of relationships and self-discovery. This is a must listen for those who are ready to overcome their toxic relationships and their toxic patterns. You can expect real talk, practical guidance, and raw and relatable guests that you'll be talking about for weeks. Let's get into it. Oh, this week we have another really great episode for you. We're in a bit of a streak, if I dare say so myself. This is one of the biggest and most requested topics, and I wanted to hold on until we got a little bit closer to the holiday season, because this is one that's especially important, and it's one we kind of get sucked into, and we can find ourselves really focusing on the closer we get to the holidays and the new year and the idea of a fresh start, and that is childhood trauma. We are going to be cracking the ice today on childhood trauma, but more specifically, the five different archetypes that we kind of fall into when we are the victims of extreme childhood trauma or dysfunction. Just before we get started, though, I wanted to let you in on an exciting little secret. Just between me and you, I'm going to be doing a free live training Saturday, December 11th at 9 a.m. Central Time. Now, this live training is unique. It's all about creating more mindful presence on social media and through our blogs and the content and media that we ingest. This is very important on a couple of different levels. Social media is here to stay. It's how we connect. And it's a powerful tool for creating relationships, opportunities, all kinds of positive things in our life. But we have to know how to use this tool wisely. And this feeds into our relationships, our marriages, the way we date. So I'm going to teach you how to build a more mindful presence for yourself on social media. More than that, if you have a blog or if you read a lot of blogs, I'm going to be teaching you the best ways to create more mindful connections using your words and the words of others. Spots are limited. So if you'd like to sign up for this free live video training, you need to head over to the real ebjohnson.com for more information, or you can visit me on Instagram at the real EB Johnson. Click the link in my bio and you will get a handy dandy little sign up form and all the information is right there. Now, childhood trauma and the childhood trauma archetypes. What is this? How can this help us to improve our lives and these healing and recovery journeys that we're on? Well, it all starts first with understanding what trauma is, especially as it pertains to childhood trauma, because a lot of us have these kind of archaic notions that childhood trauma only exists if you get like really beat or you get, you know, trigger warning, sexually abused. Trauma is far more complex than that. Okay, trauma doesn't have to be a physical injury of any kind. It doesn't have to come with substantial silver screen quality um, pain and antics and horrors. Trauma is severe emotional upset. It's any experience that makes you feel extremely afraid, extremely uncertain, extremely unstable. Um, These experiences separate us from our sense of self, They separate us from all of our core beliefs and baselines that we're establishing throughout our development. Childhood trauma is very serious and it's very complex and it penetrates and permeates through different layers of our being and our cognitive development, our growth, our understanding of self. And so for in order for us to be able to move forward and understand how these things are playing out in our lives, we have to be honest about the array of of different things that constitute childhood trauma. Sure, childhood trauma absolutely happens through the kind of typical ports of abuse and neglect. Your parents might hit you, they might scream and yell, they might hurt each other, create these like terrifying environments in which you never really feel physically, emotionally, mentally safe. But they may just outright neglect you. You may get left behind emotionally, you may get starved, you may get, you know, abandoned literally, materially, physically abandoned by your parent or your caretakers. Those are traumatic events and they create um, incredibly negative patterns, incredibly negative belief systems that then 
spiral into the relationships we build as adults, the careers we choose for ourselves, the quality of the life that we believe we deserve and that we work to achieve. There are other events in childhood, however, that achieve these same kinds of you know, trauma marks on our brain, because that's ultimately what trauma is. It's brain damage. You know, it's these huge, huge experiences, these huge events that damage our brain and damage the way we think and react, even the way we speak and develop as humans, the, the quality of our memory, the, you know, the way we are able to literally perceive ourselves from a cognitive standpoint. So that's why trauma is not simply just abuse, okay? There can also just be emotional turmoil in the house. Maybe someone loses their job, money gets short. Oh my gosh, when the money gets short, that is when so much chaos and trauma is brought into the household. There is no experience quite as traumatizing for the entire family as poverty. But there can also be divorce, you know, if if someone's having a bad time at work or if you're dealing with parents who themselves have a bunch of trauma that they haven't resolved. All of these things can also create experiences that are traumatizing for children. But likewise, just observing our parents, your parents might love you dearly. And maybe you grew up and you knew your entire life that your parents loved you and they supported you, but maybe they always showed up drunk. Maybe they always showed up with a different partner. Maybe you watched them spiral through bad abuse. Maybe you watched them go through partner after partner in the same horrible cycles. You were never directly affected, but watching them tear their lives apart was emotionally destructive for you. And that can cause trauma, which creates patterns that you later mimic in your own life. We must consider too, though, when we're considering childhood trauma and the full scope of the things that happened to us and how we were affected, that there is also natural disasters and heartbreaks to account for as well as civil disruption and unrest. We're living in a chaotic world. Things happen. Life moves fast. Parents die. Siblings also are lost. Children can experience horrendous loss. Natural disasters. Maybe they lose their home in a storm. Maybe they lose a family member in a storm. These kinds of experiences are also traumatic. And if that's something that you went through and it was never fully addressed and you were never given the tools to literally address it and communicate with your brain, then that's something you'll struggle with in adulthood as well. It will forever leave a mark, a wound that never quite heals. Um, And the same with civil unrest and disruption, right? All these protests, watching men and women literally be lynched in the streets. These are the kinds of events that are also traumatic. I mean, I will never forget bodies falling out of the World Trade Center. I mean, it still makes me sick. I can't watch that footage without becoming horrifically emotional on so many different levels. These major events, political events, world events, moments of civil civil disruption and unrest, revolutions, Arab Springs, these kinds of things, trauma. It's trauma because what's more destabilizing than your entire world being disrupted? It's trauma. So when we experience these things, they leave a scar, they leave a mark. And in order for that scar, that wound or that mark to be healed or eased in our lives, we have to literally address it and we have to use some tools to kind of reshape the way we're feeling and seeing and perceiving ourselves and the experience that we've been in. But most of us don't get that right. We get the trauma experience and the cognitive disruption. Depending on where you were at in your childhood, it will have upset your development. It could have delayed speech. It could have delayed your physical ability, your mental development, definitely your emotional development. But it also affects like your memory. That's why you see so many uh, people with childhood trauma who are extremely forgetful. There's also a really high crossover between trauma and children with ADD, ADHD. So there's a lot of disruption to the brain. The actual, literal, physical form of the brain gets damaged and altered. And then the way it works gets tied up into that. So when that happens, we kind of get broken and we get warped and we get turned around. And we can find ourselves spiraling into kind of five categories or five certain archetypes. And when we look at that archetype, wow, 
it opens the door on understanding. We're able to understand our inner child, but more than that, we're better able to understand ourselves, how we react in the big moments of lives and how we were shaped and coerced and kind of conditioned to act that way. The first archetype is the necessary hero. And this is one of the most tragic ones. It's also very, very common. And it especially happens when you are the oldest child or the only child. And the necessary hero is this. The necessary hero becomes the child that bears the burden of the entire family. They are usually one who kind of goes out and achieves, achieves, achieves. And they kind of develop this idea that however they are perceived in the world is the reflection of the family. Parents very often put these heavy expectations on the oldest child, but any kind of oldest elder child with a sense of basic compassion sees what's happening. They're a bit more removed than the parents. And so they adjust. They try to fill in the gaps. Very often you will see this kind of archetype, this kind of person, this victim of childhood trauma, they become overachievers. Uh, but more than that, they become perfectionists. They get really tied up in their work and really tied up in the idea that their worthiness, um, their lovability is all directly correlated to what they can produce. So they may kind of strive to have over the top kind of big titles at their careers or big businesses or flashy lifestyles that they can brag about or like the perfect life, the perfect family, rigid structure. This is all tied into the necessary hero. And what happens is you end up with an individual who a never knows who they really are because they spend all of their time trying to kind of bravely hold up the world around them like Atlas um, but you also get someone who's exhausted. You can't carry that weight forever. You're not a god. You're not even a demigod. You are a human being with all the foibles and weaknesses that that entails. And so that that means you can't do that. So the necessary hero runs into that burnout, that collapse, that emotional disaster, and they find themselves at a crossroads, at a reset where big decisions have to be made. Now, next up, you have the jester. This is, you know... We all know this archetype, and a lot of us are. I know that I certainly kind of gravitate more toward this and one other archetype style than many of the others. And it's also important to know that when you're dealing with childhood trauma, you can fluctuate between these. Um, you will go through many personalities in your lifetime as you try to stabilize and fully realize who you are. So you may go from, you know, a jester to the necessary hero and back again. Depends on what stage you're in your life. But the jester archetype is the one who uses humor and levity to try to escape the pain of their past. They put on a funny face. They will do whatever they can to avoid conflict. When, when things start to get rough, the jokes come out. They're always trying to make light of it. And that's because there is so much darkness within them that they almost have this natural urge to combat it with lightness. But the problem is they can cloak too much in humor and people learn not to take them seriously. They learn not to take themselves seriously and the heavy stuff never gets dealt with. And then guess what you have? The same thing as you had with the necessary hero, that first archetype, emotional collapse, total emotional collapse okay you can't cover up the pain you have to confront it um, and also this is this tends to be the youngest child we see this a lot in the in the youngest child who has escaped some burdens because they've kind of fallen through the cracks um, but they also kind of feel this responsibility to bring a lightness when all the conflict is going on with older siblings and parents Thirdly, we have the wild child and the wild child, again, pretty common, very interesting. Uh, you usually see this in the middle child and the youngest child, but you especially see it in whichever child is kind of picked to be the scapegoat within a really, really toxic family. Now, the wild child, they're a fringe dweller. Very, very often they're kind of the black sheep of the family. It's very common for this to be the kid that fell through the cracks. 
And that's why they're usually the youngest or the middle child, because focus is usually split at the top of the children if there's multiples um, or kind of at the top and the bottom end. And then whoever's in the middle gets left behind. So that turns into a person who can sometimes always be in trouble. They're never really handed enough attention to have the tools that they need to fully develop and handle the ups and downs of life. So they can be impulsive. They can be emotional. It is not uncommon to see them be in trouble with the law. Um, They also, you'll see them flee the nest. Okay. All that chaos, all that conflict, you can't dwell in that forever. And so very often this wild child, because of all the turbulence, will either eject themselves out or be ejected out by those around them because they don't really toe the line very well. They're not willing to conform because they lack some of the emotional attachments. It's a very, very turbulent kind of category to find yourself in. And it's very easy to find yourself in that space if you're not given the emotional tools to deal with the abuse or the dysfunction or the pain that you're juggling as a kid. Now, oh, wow, this is a sad one. This is a really, really sad one. The substitute is our fourth type of childhood trauma archetype. Okay. So this is, again, it's not completely like concrete set in stone but this is something that a lot of victims of super dysfunctional families or families in which there's a lot of addiction problems they can find themselves becoming what's called a substitute so this is a child who has to step up they become a parent to a parent who is a complete wreck or maybe they have to become a parent or a caretaker to siblings who are getting neglected by the parents who are off dealing with all of their own dramas. This child ends up becoming wise beyond their years, and they can end up wanting to help a lot in their careers and their lifestyles. But here again, they learn that they have to just pour out all this emotional labor all the time, and they end up completely burned out. But more than that, they end up alone because the substitute gives their energy and their time and their love and their space away to people who take advantage of them. They're the ones who pick up the pieces and that's what they did in childhood. Probably they probably had to pick up the pieces after a divorce or some kind of upset when they were all of a sudden made emotionally responsible far more than they ever should have been. So the substitute, it's important to realize when we were put into this forced mental and emotional maturity so that we can realize how damaging that is in our adult lives. Now, last but not least, in this kind of childhood trauma archetype list, you've got the aimless wanderer, the aimless wanderer. And this one, wow, wild card, total wild card. And you probably know someone who's gone this route. And you see this a lot with children who dissociate and detach from their trauma. The aimless wanderer goes inward. They shut down emotionally. They don't act out. They don't lash out. They conform. They stay quiet and they focus on an inward world. They're very creative. They're very imaginative. They will enjoy spending time alone. And a lot of this, it's not because they're just a quirky, quiet personality or they're just shy. This can be a result of childhood trauma. And that builds and builds and builds as you're an adult. This is not the child who usually ejects themselves dramatically. They might go through high school, go through college, get their degree, and then they kind of just detach because they were never really attached in the first place. It's a kid that spends all their time alone in the room. And when they grow up, they become that same person. They don't really know how to connect. They probably crave those connections, but they don't know how to do it. They live in a fantasy world. They're wrapped up in imagination that they had to escape into in order to escape the pain that they didn't know how to handle. And this becomes dangerous when we can't dwell in reality. And that especially plays out in our intimate relationships. The aimless wanderer wanders through life. They wander through their relationships. They don't really know what's wrong because, again, they don't have the tools to deal with it. And while you might escape the extreme emotional burnouts, you certainly end up heartbroken and you end up resentful and you end up disappointed both with yourself and the quality of life that you're able to build. But what is the point what is the point of knowing these these archetypes, right? Okay, yeah, I'm a nameless wanderer. I'm a substitute. I'm a this. I'm a that. So what? So what? Well, if you can kind of identify yourself within this realm of archetypes, it empowers you to do a lot. 
first of all, it gives you the ability to heal. Okay, you can't recover and find that peace and find that confidence and sense of self until you know what the problem is. And childhood trauma is complex. Sometimes you got to dig deep. Sometimes you don't even realize things happen until you like pass a certain flower in the street that sparks a memory. So knowing what these archetypes are, knowing how we kind of act and react to life, it is powerful because it enlightens us. It opens up the doors to that path that we need to travel in order to reach our wholeness again. Knowing these archetypes also, however, kind of gives us the power to write a new narrative. When you're standing there in the moment and you go, oh, wow. I play substitute for everyone around me. I try to play mommy in all my relationships. I try to play mommy with all my friends. I try to be that sense of that source of support and love and unconditional kind of affection and support that my parents weren't, but I'm empty and no one's pouring back into me. When you realize that you're able to go, oh, well, if that's who I am, I don't want to be that. That does not match with my ideal vision of self. So I'm going to be this. And you are able to sit down and write a new story for yourself, more powerful story, a more self-actualized story for yourself. And that changes the game. That's when your relationships change. That's when you start opening new doors on career opportunities. That's when you get that lifestyle and that ease and that confidence that enables you to improve the conditions of your future and your life. And what's not powerful about that? One of my favorite kind of abilities or bright side silver linings that comes from really digging into this kind of archetype theory and figuring out how we are moving through our lives as adult survivors of childhood trauma is that we get to establish a new self-worth. We no longer have to be beholden to whatever narcissistic parents or all the dysfunction and disaster that taught us we were worthless. We can start over from square one. We can look back and say, that was a child. That has nothing to do with who I am as an adult. It doesn't have to. I am not worthless. That was literally a child. I am just as worthy as anyone else because I was innocent when those things happened. And when you rebuild the self-worth, it improves the way you approach your relationships, the quality of the partners that you're, you will pursue, the quality of career opportunities you will pursue for yourself. It's like, again, it's like... If you've already shown the sun on the path, this is now a megawatt light (laughs) to give you even more clarity. Once you've got that self-worth, you're able to step into who you truly are. And that's transformative. What this archetype theory also does, though, is it empowers us. It enables us to get the help we need. Just going to therapy without really understanding your childhood trauma. You might go through so many different therapists. Not every therapist, counselor, coach, whoever you get help from is equipped to deal with childhood trauma, childhood experiences. Even if they say they are, they may not necessarily be able to juggle what you specifically went through. So you may find someone who can help you deal with a mother who screamed at you a lot, but you that same therapist may not necessarily be the best when it comes to confronting sexual abuse. You need to be really specific about the pain points and the trauma in your life so that you can find the right help. OK, and make no mistake, you've got brain damage if you have childhood trauma, so you need professional help of some kind. But that starts with knowing what you need. You need to go in with a list of specifics. Even if it's not complete, it doesn't have to be complete and comprehensive. You just need a starting point. You need to understand the general kind of idea of what went wrong and what you want to dive into and explore further so that you can improve your mental and emotional health. Obviously, I'm a coach. Woohoo! Surprise, surprise. Um, And with that, I get a lot of people who come to me who have dealt with childhood trauma and they're kind of in the later stages of their healing. And with that, they are looking to set new patterns. And again, this archetype kind of theory, this understanding idea, that's what it helps us to do. We can look honestly at the patterns that are repeating over and over and over again, when you see that you are the joker and every time things get close to vulnerability, you make a joke out of it, you can create a new pattern. When you start to feel that discomfort, instead of making a joke, you can go and sit down with a journal or step away. 
use the NLP techniques that you've been taught by me or some other coach. Calm yourself down. Get through the emotions. Get through the thoughts rather than brushing them off and making them seem insignificant with a joke. Because they're not. They're serious. They need to be addressed. So in order for us to put all these old patterns that make us unhappy to rest... We have to (laughs) dig into the current patterns that we have. And that starts with looking through our entire life story from childhood to the present moment. And lastly, when we kind of embrace this archetype idea, we can shed expectations. And wow, that is so powerful. If you are one of the necessary heroes or the substitute or even the aimless child who has spent your life being wild because you're trying to buck any sense of responsibility or expectation. When we are really honest, when we really embrace ourselves, embrace everything that we are, that we were, everything that happened to us, we can then look at those things and go, I don't claim them anymore. They were never mine. They were never mine. The only thing that's my responsibility is this body right here, right now. How do I make this emotional body better? This mental body, this physical body. That's what I'm responsible for. I'm not responsible for all this nastiness, this chaos, this trauma, this upset. That's theirs. They did it to me. I was a child. I couldn't be responsible for it. I couldn't even consent. My brain wasn't even fully developed. You've got to let that go. And when you let that go, you can shed expectations and start focusing on what you expect from yourself because you are the one who is working for your higher self, your highest goals. And that happiness, that sense of quiet peace that you've needed all along. And that's it. That's it. You have got to embrace yourself. You've got to embrace your inner child and embrace that trauma as painful as it is, as difficult as that journey is, as never ending as it is, you got to get on the path. Because if you don't get started, you're going to stay in the same place with all those same anxieties, those resentments, those failures. All of that dark stuff, all of those mistakes you keep making again and again and again, more often than not, it's tied into the baselines and patterns that were received in childhood. And sure, that was their responsibility, but your responsibility starts right here and right now. Who are you going to be? Are you going to stay that stuck, scared little child? Or are you going to improve your life, your family's life? Are you going to give this species a chance of surviving by making sure you don't hand down the same nastiness and negativity that was hoisted onto you? You're the only one who can make that choice and the literal quality of your future and the future of the world rests on it. Thank you so, so much for listening today. I hope that this episode was helpful. If you would like to learn more about the childhood trauma archetypes, you can head over to eb-johnson.com and that will take you to my six-time top-rated medium.com blog. There you can find out so much more about each of the different childhood trauma archetypes and how they really, really affect every facet of your life. Again, thank you so much. If you'd like to get coached by me, head over to therealebjohnson.com. There's a few applications still open for my eight week private coaching program. This is an NLP program and it's all about learning how to communicate with your brain, communicate with your emotions, and then create new behavioral patterns for yourself. So if you want to get involved in that, and set yourself up for mental and emotional success in the new year, head over to therealebjohnson.com. Otherwise, until then, guys, I will see you next week. Have a good one. Bye-bye.